to, to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot uh, to be our inaugural speaker at today's annual lecture. Um, I'm sure if you go on Wikipedia or on the internet on Michael's website, you will have his full CV. Uh, I'm going to do a life course uh, description in a very few words. So Michael uh, has had a very distinguished career. He was born in London, but his family moved to Sydney in Australia, where he went to uh, school and subsequently Sydney University, where he qualified in medicine. Uh, so born in London, went to Australia, qualified as a doctor in Sydney. It's during his time as a clinical student, and I don't know whether we've got any clinical students here today or medical students. There's Cardiff University. <laughs> That's a shame, but it, anyway, so uh, when Michael was a medical student, obviously uh, seeing a psychiatric uh, clinic outpatients, he describes uh, seeing a very depressed uh, woman who came from a very disorganized home environment, and you can imagine the sort of things that might go on there apart from poverty. Uh, and uh, you know, just difficult housing, uh, overcrowding, and so on. And uh, the psychiatrist um, obviously said a diagnosis. Let's call it depression. And then prescribed uh, the red tablets, and then said, "I'll see you again in a month." Mm -hmm. I think all, all, I mean, doctors in the audience and um, CPNs or other health workers probably recognise that mismatch between the evident needs of the patient and the prescription of a drug and the period of one month, three months, six months. And that occurred to Michael when he describes it in this excellent book, by the way, if people haven't read it, The Health Gap, how that made him think about the social determinants of health, uh, that it appeared insufficient to simply prescribe some tablets and ask the patient to come back in a few weeks' time. So obviously as a medical student in Sydney, he probably drew attention to himself by asking kind of quest awkward questions and being noticed for his inquiring mind. So he was guided towards the University of California in Berkeley uh, to do epidemiology and public health. Um, and uh, that's where he moved next from Sydney to California where he did a master's in public health and then a PhD looking at the health impact of migration of Japanese people leaving Japan, those who stayed in Hawaii, halfway across the Pacific, and those who continued and went to California in the USA, and just looked at what happened to their ischemic heart disease outcomes. Um, and in Japan, relatively high stroke rate, relatively low myocardial infarction rate, and you saw a transition as they moved across to America. And it occurred to Michael, quite rightly, that this was unlikely to be a genetic change in their body. Uh, so it obviously had an environmental impact. So this strengthened that he had his PhD on uh, the observation of environmental effects on health. So his next move was to London, uh, to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, where he uh, continued to do epidemiology and became engaged in two very famous studies called Whitehall studies, Whitehall 1 and Whitehall 2. And uh, this took advantage of the civil service uh, stratification. And having been a civil service, I kind of understand this uh, graded structure from senior executive officer, you know, all the way up to grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, grade 7, all the way up to permanent secretary. So civil service is very graded. So Michael and the Whitehall studies chose to examine the health outcome. At the time, there was quite a lot of talk about um, whether stress in senior management or, or senior people led to heart disease, you know, stress might cause heart disease. And in fact, Michael identified at this point something that he's promulgated ever since, which is there is a social gradient. And as the grades in the civil service went up, the life expectancy and the health and well-being actually improved, despite the appetite stress of senior leaders. And so this was the start of him not only saying with the Japanese there's environmental impact, and then there's also social stratification. And um, during this time, I mean, I remember looking at sort of sociology at the time, and there used to be a big distinction between manual labor and non manual labor, and obviously civil servants are non manual labor. So this was stratification in non manual labor, and that's the start of the social gradient. Um, and so he continued to build his reputation in social epidemiology. 
and he joined the Atchison Review of Health Inequalities in the late 1990s. Uh, and remember the Atchison Review looked at the Black Report, which came out in 1980, and Margaret Whitehead's Health Divide, uh, and other work on inequalities. And Atchison tried to bring together people to think about, and so what do we do? And Michael was part of that group, in, which published um, in 1998, The Health Divide um, and Inequalities in Health. And in 2005, he was invited to chair the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Uh, so this suddenly became a global mission of social epidemiology, influencing the WHO and through the WHO United Nations. And this, he produced this wonderful report in 2008 called Closing the Gap in a Generation. So take note that there is an optimistic uh, note here. So public health people like me are often being described and criticised as looking at people who have died and interpreting people who have died. But actually, I think Michael's turning around and saying, actually, yes, there is a big gap. We can uh, transform that in a generation, which was the subject of that report. And basically, he's built his huge global reputation on providing evidence and knowledge, conceptualizing that for us all, and making recommendations. He continued to do a WHO European study, and was also asked by English ministers to do a report on health equalities and inequalities in England, published Fair Society, Healthy Lives. So basically, um, Michael has continued to uh, produce global reports which have had global impact and this latest one which tonight on health equity and dignified lives I think will draw on his most recent one which is looking across the Americas uh, can you imagine that from Canada to Chile uh, looking at health outcomes across the Americas and looking at the social determinants of health which is his most recent report and I really look forward to, to hearing from Michael because every report adds a new dimension and something even more interesting. Um, as Catherine said, we Michael will speak for about 45 minutes and then I'll have a quick dialogue with, with him, uh, question and answer, and then I'll invite the audience to ask questions. We'll close this bit at um, 7.15. So Michael, welcome and thank you very much for coming. You might have heard me. Last time I was here, I only thought about something different. Actually, um, I was once giving a lecture in the Netherlands, and my host said, I've seen all your slides at least twice before. And I said, That's interesting. Half the slides I showed, I've never shown them. <laughs> Got me thinking, I've been talking about inequalities in health my whole life, but the specifics change and dramatic improvement. I said I um, am very concerned about inequalities within countries, and if we look at under five mortality by income quintile for different African countries, this is the richest quintile, that's the poorest quintile in Cameroon, and you see these dramatic inequalities within countries and between countries. So there's Kenya. In fact, the worst off in Kenya is better in terms of under five mortality than the best of in Cameroon. So huge inequalities between and within countries. At the Brazil meeting, I, I have been in Rwanda, at the Brazil meeting, um, a doctor from Rwanda kept showing me the data from Rwanda. He said, have you seen what we've done? Um, Female to male ratio in secondary school in 2000, it was about 50 girls in school for every 100 boys. The Millennium Development Goal target was 100. In 2015, there were more girls in secondary school than boys. They met the MDG and then some. Underweight, less than five. In 2000, that's what it was. That was the MDG target. They made great progress. They didn't actually meet the MDG target. Extreme poverty, 2000, the MDG target, and where it was in 2015. So think of Rwanda with that grisly history and the progress that can be made. Very encouraging. I've 
we'll get to the Americas, I promise you. But last week I was in Cairo and we launched a new commission on social determinants of health in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO. The Eastern Mediterranean region, sporty name for it, stretches from Morocco all the way across North Africa, includes Somalia and Djibouti, the whole of the Middle East, and then Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. There's a bit of politics in here because they didn't want to put Pakistan and India together. So Pakistan and Israel couldn't be there, so they put that in you. <laughs> um, but huge. And one of the big issues in this region of the world, which is, of course, relevant to Africa, is the effect of conflict. Look at Syria, life expectancy in 2010 and 2017. Conflict, of course, kills people, but it has indirect effects on the social determinants of health because of the effect of conflict on disrupting everything. Libya went down, Iraq went down, and Syria was the most so conflict is one of the big issues that we're going to have to address in our new commission. Okay, let me get to the Americas. One of the Americas is the United States. This is life expectancy for men and women from 1960 to 2015. Look at these two Asian countries, Hong Kong, much in the news at the moment, and Japan. And Cuba and the United States, there was Cuba. Cuba now has longer life expectancy than the US. Interestingly, Hong Kong has marginally longer life expectancy than Japan and much longer than the US. I showed this figure at the National Academy of Medicine in Washington recently and so that the Americans wouldn't feel too badly. I put Russia on. <laughs> so these are the OECD countries as a whole, the rich country club, and this is the United States. Something went terribly wrong, went terribly wrong. Life expectancy in the US has declined three years in a row. No one in this country can be smart. The rise in life expectancy in the UK has stalled, stopped in England, and life expectancy is declining for men and for women in Wales, for men and for women in Scotland, for men in Northern Ireland. And I ask, is this our future? And if we look at what's happened to life expectancy in the US, what we've got here is life expectancy for men age 50 by year of birth. And, as Tony said, what I've done my whole adult life, it seems, is to look at the gradient. So these are deciles of income. So men who were born in 1920 will be 50 in 1970. And you can see the gradient. The higher the income, the higher the life expectancy. Now look what happened over the next 30 years to the cohort born in 1950. Life expectancy for the poorest 10% of men went up a tiny bit, went up a bit more for the next 10%, a bit more for the next 10%, and the richer they were, the bigger the increase. The gradient got steeper, the inequalities got bigger. It's a gloomy, nearly winter's day. I don't want to make it gloomier, but you're strong. You can handle the next one, I'm sure. <laughs> That's what mm. Life expectancy went down for the bottom 10% of women, for the next 10%, and for the third decile of income. Life expectancy for the bottom 30% of women declined. And the higher the income, the bigger the increase. 
the inequalities got dramatically bigger. And remember, this is at a time when life expectancy is stalling. And inequalities are getting bigger. I will, I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but on the 25th of February, publish the Marmot Review, 10 years on, so it will be 10 years after I did my English <coughs> review. And the background is, as I said, <coughs> stalling of life expectancy and increases in inequalities. And the mind is an important gateway by which social determines the effect of health. One of the dramatic findings in the US is the rise of so-called deaths of despair. Poisonings, due to drugs and alcohol, particularly opioid poisonings, suicide, and alcohol-related deaths. And there are psychosocial pathways to physical illness, behaviors, and stress pathways. And we see these gradients everywhere. So from our studies in the Americas, look at Brazil classifying area of residence by socioeconomic level. The lower the socioeconomic level, the higher the mortality from cardiovascular disease. So Brazil is a country that still has malnutrition and infectious disease, but the major causes of death are non-communicable diseases, and the lower you are in the hierarchy, the higher the mortality. It's a gradient. So, the Pan American Health Organization, the American region of WHO, asked me to chair this commission on equity and health inequalities in the Americas, and we called our report, which we published on the 1st of October, a few weeks ago, Just, Soci <coughs> Just Societies, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. The idea that if we can create the conditions for people to lead dignified lives, health would improve and the cause of health equity would be advanced. <clears throat> I quoted Nelson Mandela, one of my colleagues, who said, couldn't you quote somebody from the Americas? I said, Nelson Mandela's universal, <laughs> applies to all of us. <laughs> Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice. It's the protection of fundamental human rights, the right to dignity and a decent life. The conceptual, don't panic, I will go through this, so it'll be all right. Somebody wrote to me today that this conceptual framework builds on the conceptual framework we had for the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, the 2008 Closing the Gap report. Somebody wrote to me today an email, someone I didn't know, who said, can you help me? I'm trying to find criticism of your framework <laughs> and, I can't, and I can't find it. <laughs> Can you help me? I thought, what a task. I should start looking for criticisms of my framework. Well, actually, I haven't heard too many. We talk about structural drivers. <clears throat> Macroeconomic determinants. Climate change and the environment and relationship to land and the history and legacy of ongoing colonialism and structural racism. Ongoing colonialism. When my commissioners in the Americas said, we've got to talk about colonialism, I said, do you mean historically? They said, no, what's going on right now are still the effects of colonialism. And these impact conditions of daily life had seven, seven recommendations about conditions of daily life, and those affect health equity and dignified lives. More explicitly than previously, we looked at intersectionality, social and economic inequities, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, disability, migration. The idea that the more of these you have, the more disadvantaged you are. And 
two recommendations related to taking action, governance and human rights. Human rights we saw as a value, the right to health and the right to the social determinants of health, and as a mechanism for action, using human rights instruments to galvanize change. Is it a matter simply of getting rich? This is a version of the Preston Curve for the Americans. It plots on the x-axis gross domestic product per person, adjusting for purchasing power, and life expectancy on the y-axis. So, Haiti is very poor. It's a reasonable supposition that if Haiti national income went up to the level of Bolivia's, health would improve. The country's very poor. We can't spend things on sanitation and good nutrition and shelter and the like. Get a bit richer and you can spend on those things. If Bolivia got as rich as Brazil, it may well be that its health would improve to that of Brazil. And if Brazil got as rich as Chile, again, health might improve. But look at Costa Rica, Cuba, and Chile, and go all the way up. So here we're at about $17,000 per person, gross domestic product, and <coughs> adjusting for purchasing power. And go all the way out to the United States mm. at 60000 and there's no relation between national income and life expectancy. Canada has a national income about 20% less per person than the US, and life expectancy two to four years longer for men and women. Getting richer is very helpful for poor countries, but once you get to the level of Costa Rica, Cuba, Chile, getting richer is not the solution to getting healthier. Action on the social determinants of health is much more important. I told you not to panic, I would go through them. Inequities in power, money, and resources, structural claims. So equity in political, social, cultural, and economic structures. ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, turns out to be extremely helpful. I think the people who work for the ECLAC are far more radical than the governments that sponsor it. Yeah. Uh, so they've looked at the absolute changes to the Gini coefficient, a measure of income inequality, through direct social spending and in-kind transfers. So a country like Argentina reduces the Gini coefficient by both direct transfers, in other words, the taxation system, and in-kind transfers, funding services, and the like. Mexico does it a bit, and El Salvador very little. So they classify comprehensive social protection, intermediate social protection, and limited social protection. Fact is, Latin American countries vary enormously in the degree of social protection they offer their citizens, and it's not only related to how rich look at the rich countries, two in the, U in the Americas, the US and Canada. This is the share of total income going to the top 1%. In the US, in 1928, the top 1% had 23% of total household income. 1929 was the crash, the great crash. Everything came tumbling down was followed by the Great Depression, including the share of income going to the top 1%. Through the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, it was 12%, nearly down to 10%. And then in 1980, wow, it took yeah. off. And by 2007, it was again <coughs> nearly 23%. And you remember what happened next? The global financial crisis. The UK, we've had a steep increase, not as big as the, as the US, but pretty big. 
but it shows. But look at Australia, nowhere near has been. Very successful country. That rise of the share by the top 1% is justified by the top 1% as saying, oh, we're responsible for the prosperity of the country. We urge it. Oh, aren't we terrific? The distant rumble of self-interest can be heard. <laughs> and one of the effects of what's been going on in the US is pretty dramatic. In, 19, uh, in people who were born in 1940, about 90% 90 of children could expect to earn more than their parents. And look what's happened. For children born in 1984, who are now adults, the chance of being richer than their parents is about 50-50. The American dream was you work in a metal bashing industry, you belong to a union, you're well paid, you pay for your kids to go to college, you have a cabin by the lake, everything gets better. That's gone. The metal bashing industries have been replaced by the gig economy. And the kids, it's about 50-50. And that may be part of what's going on with the stalling life expectancy. Can you do anything about that? Well, there's something called taxation. These two professors from Berkeley, Sells and Zuckman, did something rather special. They looked not just at income tax, but federal, state, local taxes, and sales tax. They got all the taxes. Uh, so it was a special investigation. And you can't see it very well, but there's income group along here. And in 1950, the tax rate was quite progressive. The higher the income, the higher the rate of tax. And that's federal, state, and local. 1980, hmm, somewhat less progressive. 2016, wow, these guys are doing pretty well. They didn't find those politicians for no reason at all. <laughs> they expected to get something for their money. And look what they got. And then that guy in the White House said, we've got the biggest tax change ever in the whole history of the country and it's going to benefit the average person. <laughs> this is the rate paid by the top 400 earners. Change in effective, effective tax rates, 1962 to 2018. The bottom 50%, it went from 22.5% to 24%. What's sportingly called the middle 40%, i.e. 50 to 90. It went up from 25 to 27.6. The top 10% went down very nicely, thank you. The top 1%, the top 0.1%, the top 0.01% and the richest 400 went from 54% to 23%. The richest 400 pay a lower rate of tax than any other income group in the United States. Is there any universe where that's fair or justified by anything other than you get what you pay for? You buy the politicians and you expect them to do this for you. And by golly, they've delivered. Not that we in the UK are pretty high tax rates. Here's the US, about 27% of total income goes in tax. The OECD average is 33%. So there's the US. There's the UK just below the OECD average, and countries like France and Denmark and Belgium and Sweden collect tax because they invest in early child development and education and improving society. And guess what? They're quite successful countries economically too. The idea that you've got to have a low rate of tax to be a successful country economically 
is contradicted by the evidence. And when we look at the Americas more generally, this is again from ECLAC, selected countries, the share in total income of the richest 1%. Uruguay, South Africa, Argentina, US, Ecuador, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Brazil. So the inequalities globally are the biggest in the Latin American middle to high income countries. So it's a problem right through the Americas. It's also coming back for a moment to our new EMRO Commission. This is the Gini coefficient, an index of in income inequality in Djibouti, Iran, Morocco, Yemen, and here we are, Iraq, Egypt. It's not so bad. So huge inequalities in the Eastern Mediterranean region as well. Natural environment. When we kicked off the Emerald Commission, I said one of the issues we've got to deal with is climate change. The name of the hall in the office is the Kuwait Hall. The whole bloody region's funded from oil. And I'm talking about carbon-free future. <laughs> well, Costa Rica, in 2016, nearly 100% of its energy was renewable. Panama, nearly 70%. It's quite possible to have renewables as a major contribution to the energy source. And in the UK, we're committed to a carbon-free, carbon-neutral future. Ongoing colonialism, structural racism, there's a lot I can say about this, but look at indigenous populations and non-indigenous populations not attending secondary school. And men, women, urban population, rural population. So we see in country after country, indigenous young people less likely to be in secondary school than non-indigenous. Conditions of daily life. We talk about equity from the start. Come back to Emro. Primary school completion has been a major global success story. Country after country um, now have a majority, if not nearly all, um, Jordan, the occupied Palestinian territory, Egypt, Tunisia. There's a little bit of a gradient, poorest to richest. Iraq, a steep gradient. But what they call group three countries. So in Emro, they've got the group one, which are the oil rich states essentially, which have good health. Group two are these ones here. And then group three, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Sudan. And look at these steep social gradients in primary school completion by wealth. And when we look at secondary school completion, ah, that's not so good. Occupied Palestinian territory, pretty good. Jordan, not bad. But in the group three countries, if you're in the bottom wealth quintile, much less likely to complete secondary school. And that has profound implications for health subsequently. And we know that attending pre-primary, preschool, is a potent predictor of school performance subsequently. So I'm back in the Americas now. This is the difference in maths performance of PISA scores. So this is the program of international student assessment where students in 60 odd countries do standardized tests on maths, literacy, and science. And students who attend preschool at age 15 have much better scores in maths than those who did not now, in most of these countries, the children who attend preschool tend to come from richer families. It's a 
social gradient in attending preschool. Allowing for that socioeconomic difference, there's still a big advantage in school performance from having attended preschool. That's not a very complex intervention. Getting kids enrolled in preschool is going to predict how well they do in school. How well they do in school is going to predict the kind of job, the income, living conditions they have as adults and their health. So pre-primary attendance by lowest and highest income quintile. This is the lowest and that's the highest in Belize and Suriname and all of these countries. The big difference, Jamaica, much less. But the lower the income, the less likely they were to attend preschool. Our Canadian commissioner, who is herself a First Nations Canadian, Indigenous Canadian, said, you don't know what it's like. You think that Canada is a rich, healthy country. So it is, if you're white. But if you're First Nation Canadian, it's not so good. But you can make a difference. The Aboriginal Head Start program in urban northern communities on three skill <coughs> areas, motor skills, academic skills, and language skills, at the beginning of the project, and at the next phase, dramatic improvement. Again, a relatively simple intervention can make a big difference to these children. And in Brazil, Bolsa Familia is a conditional cash transfer scheme. Guess what? If you give poor women money, they're not quite as poor as they used to be. What Bolsa Familia does is make that cash transfer conditional on doing certain things, taking children to health and nutrition clinics, having older children stay in school. This is an under five mortality by the coverage of Bolsa Familia. So the higher the coverage, the lower the under five mortality. All cause, diarrheal disease, dramatic low. Giving poor women money with the conditionality of going to nutrition and health clinics makes a big difference to diarrheal disease, to deaths from malnutrition. Decent work. One of the issues in lower middle income countries is being in informal work, outside the formal employment sector. And that's bad for health. Apart from job insecurity, there's no occupational health standards in the informal sector. Looking at changes in informality rates, all of these countries had declines in informality. That's great. That's a step in the right direction. But Mexico, Bolivia, and El Salvador had increases. That's a step in the wrong direction. Dignified life at older ages. So we go through the life course. You might think in a relatively low or middle income country, it's not possible to have pensions. It turns out it is possible. This is the percent of people over retirement age who received a contributory social security pension. In Guyana, 80%, Barbados, 70, Bahamas, and we get down here, very low coverage rates. And it's not simply how rich the country is. It's a political decision. Is it important to you that older people should not fall into poverty? And that relates to income and social protection. I know I'm talking about the Americas, but I couldn't resist showing you this. I think there's an election going on. <laughs> um, public spending in the UK, percent change from 2010. Transport went up. I don't know if that's all HS2. <laughs> Transport went up. And healthcare did go up a bit. Welfare for non-families, education went down dramatically, social protection went down, and welfare for families It would not be a great 
be surprised if that had a damaging impact. I wonder why life expectancy stopped improving. Nah, I can't join the dots. <laughs> and we tell people to eat healthily in the UK. If people in the bottom 10% of household income followed Public Health England's healthy eating advice, they would spend 74% of their income on food. In Wales, much better off. It's only 68% of income would they spend on food to follow the public. So it's your fault. <coughs> we tell you how to eat healthily and your stupidity, you ignore our advice. You've only got yourself to blame. Isn't that how the rhetoric goes? Mm -hmm. Well, if they eat healthily, who's going to pay the rent? <laughs> and if they pay the rent, who's going to heat the dwelling? They can heat or eat, but they can't do all three. <laughs> Housing is a food issue. I'm supposed to be in the Americas, sorry. <laughs> I say to my U.S. colleagues, you're concerned about homicide, and rightly so, but the U.S. is up here. Guatemala, Brazil, or Jamaica, El Salvador. Now, when we talk about structural drivers, in Trinidad and Tobago, part of the rise in homicide is because of the smashing of the cartels in Colombia. So the drug traffic, the route of getting drugs into North America has changed. It now goes through the Caribbean. So this is gang-related violence. Now it's usually young men killing each other, but sometimes ordinary people who aren't young men. Millennium, Millennium Development Goals, uh, which changed to SDGs, and part of the SDGs provide, as you know, 17 uh, criteria which climate change is in there. And in your work, which has spanned the transition from NDGs to SDGs, uh, how has that affected you know, your commission's work? Well, allow me to get to your question by a slight introduction. Um, Tedros, Dr. Tedros, the relatively new Director General of WHO, in a big change for WHO, has created a new division of healthier populations. He never had that before. Um, he came in saying universal health coverage was his priority. Um, but he said three billion, a billion people covered by emergency prepared, preparedness, a billion people covered by universal health coverage, more, and a billion people, healthier populations. And he asked me to be his advisor on social determinants of health. And I said that that third division should be the first division, healthy populations, and that should be WHO's lead part on the SDGs. Because I said, apart from SDG 3, which is health, at least 11 of the 17 are social determinants of health. Poverty, inequality, gender equity, climate change, and it's number 17, which is working together. Mm. Uh, so they are the social determinants of health. And given that, at least notionally, all countries have signed up to the SDGs, they are in principle signed up to the social determinants of health. Right, so WHO should play a lead role in showing how those 11, pushed it all 17, um, but how those 11 SDGs relate to health and health equity. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's a potential conflict between universal health coverage and dealing with social determinants? No, I don't think there should be a conflict. The only conflict is if, when you start talking about health equity, if people only want to talk about access to health that's where the conflict comes. And too often, and this is just a bugbear of mine, if you look up 
the World Bank and look up OECD, they talk about spending on health. They don't mean that. They mean spending on health care. Mm -hmm. Spending on early child development is spending on health. Spending on rural economic development is spending on health. Um, but when they say spending on health, they mean spending on health care. So no, there should be no conflict. We know, uh, and if you want me to have a trade-off between should, if we get an extra billion, should it be spent on health care or other things? And the answer is yes, should, we should spend on both of them. Um, I mean, when you find in Pakistan, the commissioner from Pakistan last week spends 0.9% of its GDP on health care. So that's not enough. I think they should address social determinants of health, but I have no difficulty in saying that's not enough. You can't get universal health coverage if less than 1% of your GDP is spent on health care. So I don't see a conflict. We need to work together. Okay. Well, one of your slides showed what might have been the Amazon. I don't know. Uh, and so the question is about the climate emergency and how far that is influencing policy makers, um, and you started to talk about environment a bit more strongly, I think, in the America's uh, Commission. I mean, how has it impacted in your work, the urgency around climate emergency? Yeah. Well, I think one has to bring them, to, to bring the agendas together, the social determinants and the climate change. And I just agreed, you notice how the enthusiasm said that. I just agreed to chair a subcommittee for the Committee on Climate Change on getting to a carbon neutral future and the health impact. And as I said to the person who was twisting my arm, a big issue is the equity issue related both to mitigation and adaptation. As I said in, in passing, that environmental impacts are much bigger on poorer people. I mean, the, in the health gap, I talk about, it's not climate change, but it is an environmental impact. I talk about the difference between an earthquake in Haiti and an earthquake in Chile. And the earthquake in Chile was much bigger on the Richter scale than the earthquake in Haiti. But the damage in Haiti was overwhelmingly bigger because Haiti is much less prepared socially and structurally than in every other way. Chile is much better prepared um, to deal with it. And the same goes to climate change. Climate change is an inconvenience in the rich countries. It's life or death in poorer countries. And part of the migration issue is not just conflict, it's climate change. People are being driven away from their homes because of climate change. So it's absolutely, I mean, the, I started enumerating the big issues in EMRO. I said conflict, climate change, gender equity, migration. Uh, if you're a country of four million people, like Lebanon, and you have somewhere between half a million and one million Syrian refugees, if you're a country of a few million people like Jordan, and you had between half a million and one million Syrian so Turkey has two million, but it's a big country, but a small country. So we've got climate change, uh, which is driving people from their homes, and conflict, which is driving people from their homes. And we have to deal with it. And you mentioned migration, and I'm nearly going to come to your question soon, was uh, African migration up to the Mediterranean. And, uh, and I, I wondered about, you said, I think, the WHO Africa are not ready yet for a commission, but uh, in, in your work, because many people here, I think, have got health links with sub-Saharan African countries. Excuse so. my back, sorry. <laughs> That's all right, Can people hear all right at the back yeah. there? Yeah. You're okay. so, so the question really is, is, I mean, you haven't done a commission yet in Africa, let's hope you you will, but in the same that the Pan Americas have particular characteristics, looking at sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. What sort of things um, occur to you just from your vast experience of these different 
commissions looking at different parts of the world? Well, I think the conceptual framework of the Pahal Commission, as I said, is recognizable from the conceptual framework of the original WHO Commission. And for EMRO, we only just started last week, so we haven't got there yet. But it'll proceed along the same lines. So I think the principles will be similar mm. if we could extend to Africa. The principles will be similar. But just as there's different emphases in EMRO, there would be different emphases in Afro. And a big part, and you said this in your introduction, a big part of what we're trying to do is to learn from successes. So I showed you some data from Rwanda. Now, I'm not making any pitch for the Rwandan government. Um, leave it to others to decide whether you like it or you don't like it. I'm not making any pitch for them. But the fact is, out of a disastrous situation, they made good progress. So I think when I talked about do something, do more, do better, for low-income countries, wherever they are, whether they're in Kazakhstan or in sub-Saharan Africa, they're starting at a much lower level of social investment. And, and that's very challenging. But I remember I was reminding our Indian commissioner that many years ago I said to him, is there any engineering or technical reason why every Indian should not have clean water? And he said, no, there's no technical reason. I said, is there any economic reason why every Indian should not have access to clean water? No, there's enough money around them to do it. I said, well, you've got the world's biggest democracy. Vote the rascals out. And he said, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> OK, so it's more complicated than that. You know, we, um, I tend to think that democracy is a good thing. Um, if you look at the Economist Intelligence Unit ranking of global democracies, uh, the top 20 uh, fully functioning democracies democracies are all European and Australia and New Zealand, uh, I think, and Canada. The US ranks 25th. It's a flawed democracy. Uh, I don't think any of the Emirates would come in the top 50. And a lot of the African countries are very up the rear. So um, trying to value the dignity of human lives is a major challenge when the political system My final question, Michael, is uh, obviously Wales for Africa Health Links Network is, you know, mutual benefit from people in Wales, whether it's institutions like, uh, you know, Cardiff <coughs> University with Judith Felix, or hospitals or communities like, say, Pont in Pontypris, um, and they kind of reflect Welsh uh, values and traditions. And, and in your book, The Health Gap, you talk about some of the progressive Nordic countries, some of whom have quite small populations. Um, there's something called a Nest or West or something, wasn't there? Uh, what can Wales do, <coughs> given that Wales is a fair trade nation, sustainable nation, you know, got the Wales Future Generations Act, uh, has positioned itself, um, has picked up uh, proportionate universalism in First Minister in Wales, and I'm sure Jane Hutt will support that, uh, you know, adopts a proportional, uh, proportionate universalism. So what can Wales do, in your advice, more and better in order to enable its global partnerships with uh, others, do you think? <laughs> well, we're, um, Wales' population is three million. Yes. Uh, we're working with Greater Manchester, 2.8 million, so yeah. same size, uh, with the mayor, Andy Burnham, and the chief executive of the city council. So we've got key players from outside the health sector uh, and health and social care as well. And huge inequalities within Greater Manchester, yes. like you have in yes. Wales. So big issues to deal with. But the first is getting a commitment. Uh, 
right across government, every layer of government, civil society, organisations, not just government, and the population. Uh, absolutely vital. There is something about science. I think uh, it's much easier with a population of 3 million than it is with a population of 65 million, 60 million, um, because obviously there's heterogeneity within Wales, but still everybody knows everybody and you can, you, you can get I mean, on one of my visits, I was sitting with uh, the Minister of Health, a man named Draper, the First Minister, and he said, I think the Minister of Finance needs to hear this. And, and next minute, the Minister of Finance was sitting around the table. And then whatever the Minister was called, Social Justice, or whatever, mm -hmm. Social he needs to hear this, and the next minute he was sitting around the table. Well, I thought the very idea in London that the Secretary of State for Health would dial up the Chancellor and say, come and listen to this. Firstly, he gets stuck in a traffic jam, but secondly, he say, I'm more important than you are. You can't summons me to any meeting. It would never happen. So I think the, the scale is important, but there's no getting away from the importance of having As I said a few moments ago, uh, valuing every human life, uh, as as Nelson Mandela said, um, having the right to lead a life of dignity, uh, a valuable life, is absolutely vital, and that of course should spread to whatever Wales is doing with its African network. Thank you very much. So I think we, we've got time for um, a couple of quick questions. All based on evidence and the Americas today but it's in the it's across the world and I'm very pleased you put that slide in about the UK. <laughs> I, I don't expect we knew there'd be a general election when you were <laughs> uh, you know obviously we have to thank Tony for inviting you um, but it, it is it's so relevant so important. I mean people might not be interested to know and you might be interested to know Michael that um, the reason I was late was because I came from the assembly where we just voted for 16 and 17 year olds mm -hmm. and for all foreign nationals to be able to vote in assembly elections. So I hope everyone can. <laughs> I have to say it was resisted by certain people in our assembly. We won't go there, but it was such a wonderful moment when you sometimes feel being a politician is, is worth it because that's so important in terms of our young people and their prospects. Uh, because I am responsible for the well-being of each generation's legislation and it has to be about how they influence us. So I think um, yeah, I was the finance minister who you met. You won't probably remember this. It was a woman, actually, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, when Mark Draper was health minister and we met in Public Health Wales and Gordon Gething was the um, property minister yeah, he's and he's now the health minister yeah. and Mark is the First Minister, so we do all move around, around but we're basically like you, and I, I remember one of the points I ma made by, about what you said was that once you're into this and you understand about just societies and health equity, you don't give up, you keep going. And I think that applies to a lot of us who've been around since the beginning of devolution in Wales and before, and we've got an awful lot to learn about how we could take this forward. And I know it's great to hear that you're working with Matt and with Andy Berman in Manchester. So, uh, yes, I'm very pleased to be the patron of the Wales for Africa Health Links Network. Um, and I think uh, I was spent part of my childhood in Africa and Uganda. I suppose that's had a big influence on my politics, uh, but also I'm a trustee of a, now of a of an organisation in my constituency with, which links with one particular community in, in Uganda it, and it's sort of M, the M, it's a Ugandan NGO which tells us what to do, not us telling them what to do, so it's a really important partnership. But I think one of the things I would just say is that I, through all my ministerial roles, starting with health, 
and social services, through to education, finance, and now I'm responsible for equalities and human rights. Your work and what you say about health equity rules the roost. It has to. Absolutely crucial. I came in just as you were talking about the importance of investing in early years. So we in Wales have tried to have kept investing despite 10 years of austerity in a program called Flying Start, which was like Sure Start, but adapted to meet Welsh needs. And we've struggled to hang on to Flying Start because it invests in in the most disadvantaged targeted investment in the most with the most disadvantaged um, children preschool and schools know the difference they know um, the difference when flight a child has been through the flying start pro and, it's, and the parents are part of that as well which is really important so I, I just think it's great you've come tonight um, we you know we try to develop that leadership and commitment that you talk about in terms of causes and impact of in inequity uh, and, and inequalities in health. Um, so it has to be cross-cutting, it has to be whole government. Our First Minister understands that, we understand that. It's very difficult, difficult um, after 10 years of austerity. Um, and also, but we, we have got an opportunity. I'm very pleased we had that question about diversity because we have a, a long way to go in terms of diversity in Wales, but at least if we understand and we listen to people, we know we have got a long journey to go. We need you to, to help us with that. I just wanted to say we're shortly publishing an international Welsh government international strategy. There is a focus on gender equity. Uh, are we, we're, you know, we know that investing in women is key um, to everything. We, we strive to be a feminist government but we also recognise that this week is um, the uh, international, or Monday, is International Day of Elimination of Violence Against Women, the White Ribbon Day, and the 16 days of activism across the world, actually. Um, and there is an increase in violence against women. We have a Violence Against Women Act, which we're, try which we're seeking to implement. Uh, but we, we, we know that this is a really difficult time to be a woman to be in politics, um, but we've just got to continue to carry on. And I, I want to make sure I share the health gap with, with my colleagues. So just finally, on climate change, um, and you, we, we've adopted obviously um, a an, an, uh, climate change emergency, but of course, rightly, what does that mean? Well, one thing that we were already doing was um, every time a child is born in Wales, uh, plant, a tree is planted in Africa and a tree is planted in Wales. And every child, and you may have had me or ch children or grandchildren or yourselves, um, will get a certificate where the baby is born in Wales. And I'll tell you where your tree, the tree's been planted in Wales and, and where in, in Africa. Um, and we're engaging with young people on that issue. We are a nation, we strive to be a nation of sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers. And we also um, recognise that, you know, in terms of, it's not just it, Paul Vaughan Gethin hammered today about the health budget, it's all about the health, that's all about the health service. The social determinants of health, the housing now for the forefront of the Welsh Government, the environment, equalities, education. So uh, it's great you've come to Wales. I hope one day you'll be able to mention us as being another country that's trying to, to do something. But we couldn't do it without the kind of independent, committed, academic, international perspective that we've brought tonight. Thank you.